Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are listening in the world. Uh, I'm Jonathan Graham, I'm speaking from Chicago. Um, so it's morning here. I'm based in Chicago, work for 8 Flight, a software development consultancy firm. And I also co-founded and co-run Mind Minds, a venture where we're training um, out of work and underemployed residents in a rural area of southwest Pennsylvania uh, how to program. So with both the work with 8 Flight and also the work um, with, with teaching, uh, understanding the fundamentals is really a key. Oh, can everyone see okay? I seem to have had a problem. I'm sorry, can I seem to have frozen up. Is this working? Okay, one moment and hopefully I'm back on. Okay, can everyone see okay? Do I have any messages? Okay, looks like the slides are back on. I'm sorry about that, technical issues. So, um, at the core of the work with 8th Flight and also the uh, the teaching of programming is really understanding the fundamentals because if we've got a good grasp of the fundamentals, we can adapt to the change that is inevitably going to hit us. So in the next 40 minutes, I'm going to be uh, taking a deep dive into some of the core closure functions so that we can get a really good grasp of our understanding of them and use them appropriately. So before we do, if I, if I was speaking in person and could see you, I'd be asking who has skydived before? So if you want to make some noise in the uh, chat window or on Slack to let me know, that would be great. Um, I've been skydiving, but I'm not an expert on it. But let's just imagine that, that we are an expert. So we can go, we feel in complete control, we understand our equipment, we know how to prepare it and how to maintain it. So we can do our skydive, we can safely deploy our shoes and uh, enjoy going through to landing. Okay, so we, we've got all of that um, expertise, but do we know our equipment well enough to know that we could extend what we do to base jumping? So base jumping is rather than jumping from a plane, we're jumping from a structure. So either a natural structure like a cliff or from a building. So can we take uh, what we know already about skydiving to base jumping? Do we have enough control in order to do this or are things going to go wrong? So we're going to keep this in our minds as we look through and ask the question, are we fully in control of the code that we're writing? Do we really understand the functions that we're using? And having all the inbuilt functions is great. It means we can get on with our code quickly. But do we, do we understand them enough so that we can utilize them to the full power and know the things that we can't do as well, the areas which we, we need to be um, careful about? So we're going to go through, in order to understand some of these functions, we're going to go through uh, in implementing our own versions of them all. So we're going to start with um, reduce. And we're going to start with reduce because it's, it's one of those fundamental functions that is, is important for, for a lot of the other ones that we're going to be covering. So this is pulled from the, um, from the closure docs. Um, so reduce is going to have a function which can take two arguments. So it can take one or two arguments. There's a lot here in the statement. So actually we're gonna just focus on certain bits at a time as we build up our own function. So taking one part of it, if an initial value val is supplied, reduce will return the results of applying the function to val in the first item in the collection and then applying function to that result into the second item, etc. And if the collection contains no items, we're just going to return val, and the function is not actually going to be called. So we're going to build this up in a TDD fashion. So we're going to start with a test. Um, when I did this, I used the Speckle um, testing framework. It's one that I find really useful. Um, so we, we require in the, the speckle.core. Um, and the first test that I'm going to write 
is that if we use the addition function with a val of one and empty collection, that should result in one. So we got our first test. In our reduced namespace, we can then easily just define a my reduce function, which takes in the three parameters, the function, the val, and the collection. And in order to get that first test to pass, all we need to do is return val. Okay, so that's easy. We got the first test passing. The second test could be where we have a single item in the collection. So if we have the if the, we have the element one in the collection with one as the value and we're using the addition function, that should result in two. So straightforward to just get this test to pass as well. So if the collection is empty, we're just going to return val. And if not, we're going to, we can um, apply the function to val and the first item in the collection. And this will allow that second test to pass. That's straightforward. What about if we have more than one item in the collection? So another test for this. Well, then we can build that up um, recursively. So we can obviously break the recursion when the collection is empty and just return val. And we can iterate through the collection by applying the function to the val in the first of the collection, pass that back as the new val um, to our reduce function with the function in the rest of the collection. So in this way, we can iterate through the collection uh, for and make our test pass. Okay, at this point, we could add tests with different functions, collections, and initial values. And as long as we've just got the, the one collection, that should work. So what if a value is not supplied? Then we're gonna return the result of applying the function to the first two items in the collection, then applying the function to that result uh, and the third item, et cetera, going through. So where we have no val, so very simple test case, um, just a collection with one item. And we can add the Eretian for, for where we, we don't pass the val. So in this case, we just, uh, we just need, to, need to iterate through applying the functions, need to pass the my reduce the function um, and the first of the collection um, going through is val and the rest going through to collection. And then that will proceed through to work. Okay, so we've built up now for when we don't have a value. And we can add tests, we add further tests where we got multiple items in the collection and these will still pass. Okay, so the next part of the reduce, if the collection contains no items, the function must accept no arguments as well and reduce returns the result of calling the function with no arguments. So let's look at some simple cases here. So if we have the addition function and an empty collection, that should evaluate to zero. If we have the multiplication function and an empty a collection, that should return one. So let's just extend our my reduce function to enable these tests to pass. And in our arity where we're just having the function and the collection, so the top one, we just need to Add in, if the collection is empty, we're going to evaluate the function. Otherwise, we're going to call my reduce with the first collection being set as the value and the rest being um, set as the collection. So this some works, those tests pass. So here's a question for everyone. When I was first doing this, I built up with maybe a, a dozen or so unit tests, but how many unit tests are enough to give us confidence that our implementation of this function behaves, behaves the same as the core um, reduce function. So think about that for a moment, how many is the right number of tests? I got to the point where I didn't, um, I wasn't confident that I could ever have enough tests to know that I'm considering all of the possible collection types and functions that I needed to do. So I then looked at property-based testing, 
which is where we're making statements about the expected behavior of the code that should hold true for the entire domain of possible inputs. So these statements can then be verified for many different pseudo-randomly generated inputs. So in Clojure, we're really lucky. We have test.check. Reed Draper uh, developed this a few years ago. And so in there, we can generate our, our inputs and test them across the, the domain. So I'm not going to go into any deep detail here. This would be uh, this will be a talk on its own, but just to show you, this slide covers everything that we need in order to uh, property-based test our reduce function. So at the top, we're defining our, our calls as being a generator of one of any number of um, closure collections containing any type of closure values. So we can we can generate our range of inputs, and then at the bottom we have our we have our property based test. And so the number we've got in here at the moment is a thousand. So we're going to run a thousand tests, and for all of those tests where we're pulling a collection from that generated generator of collections and a value, which can be a generator of any closure values. We can take that and we can compare what result we get when we call reduce to what we get when we recall our own implementation, my reduce, and test that they are equivalent. So in this way, both for just collections and for values and collections, we can confirm across any number of generated values and collections that our function will hold true and behave the same as um, the core function. And so we'll actually be able to do this with all of the functions that we're going to look at throughout this talk, although I won't go into more detail of it. But we can reuse the, um, the generator of the, the collections for all of those. So nice and succinctly, we can have confidence that our function is behaving as we want. Okay, so we've written our, our implementation of reduce. Does this mean now, as a skydiver, we've got confidence that we can just straight away go and base jump with the same, with the same equipment um, and understanding that we had? So how does this actually help us understand with the code? So here's, here's two things that maybe maybe came out from doing that implementation that we didn't necessarily understand before. So firstly, reduce can maybe do more than we initially thought. So if you have a function that requires two arguments, this can actually be passed to reduce with only a single argument and it will still work. So as an example, we can define a simple function f, which has um, two parameters, x and y, and we're just gonna sum those. So if we try to evaluate f1, that would obviously fail, but we can do reduce the foot of the F and a, a single item, whether the, the single value or, well, a single um, collection. So we're just passing the, the one argument to the function in reduce, and that still works. And we know that that works because when we don't have an initial value, the first item of the collection gets set as the initial value, and then we end up with an empty column, and when that's the case, we end up just evaluating the value and we never actually call the function at all. Okay, so, so we can use um, reduce in situations where we can just have one argument passed to a function, even though that function requires two. So that gives us some more understanding there. We also know that reduce um, needs to be able to evaluate the function on its own with no arguments in the case where there's no value and there's an empty collection. So as a simple case, if we try to, to reduce with the function minus and an empty collection, this will fail because minus can't be evaluated with no arguments. So when we're writing our own functions and those functions could be passed to reduce, if we need to consider if there are any edge cases where no initial value and an empty collection could get passed through. If that could be the case, then we need to make sure we write our function in a way where the function can be evaluated on its own and do the thing that we want it to do. So writing your own function, which could be passed to reduce, we need to take care of this edge case. 
Okay, so that's reduced. Let's move on quickly to count. This is an easy one. So count will just take a single collection and it's gonna return the number of items in that collection. Count of nil will return zero. So we're going to build this up again in a TDD way, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a few tests to start with. So an empty list should return zero. Nil should also return zero. If we have one item in a collection, then that should return one. So what's that function going to look like? So if we define our my, my count function, which um, takes in the collection, we can say if that collection is empty, we return zero. So the closure function empty returns true for nil as well. So if it's nil or empty, it will return zero. Otherwise, we're going to return one. So this is all we need in order to get those first three tests to pass. What about when we write tests where we got more than one element? Well, then we, we can start looking at building this up recursively. So if we, we set our loop uh, point, so where we have the collection, so call starting as our initial collection, and we set the results initially to zero. So if our collection is empty, we're just going to return the result. So if we're starting off with an empty collection, this will be zero. Otherwise, we're going to recurse through. So we're going to iterate through the collection. And each time we're going to increment the results. So each time we, we go through, we'll increment the results until the collection is empty, at which point we return that result. So that's fine. We can write a bunch of tests for different, um, for different collection types and and they will pass with this function so it doesn't look the doesn't look the neatest of functions maybe we can refactor this and now we've got the, the passing test suite is a good time to do it so what are we actually doing here we're iterating through through a collection and just returning a single value so this sounds like something that we've just um, we've just written with my reduce. So let's rewrite our my count using our my reduce function that we've just done. So in this case, we all we need to do is have our function to be something that that takes the two um, as two parameters, so our result, and actually, and the the other thing is the collection, but we don't care about that in the body of the function because all we want to do. Each time we're, we're going through, as we're iterating through the reduce, is to increment the result. So if we have our, our initial inputs as zero and the collection, we're going to iterate through the collection, increment the result each time using our reduce. So we've now made our my count function, um, utilizing the my reduce function that we'd already that we'd already written, and it makes it a lot clearer and a lot more succinct what's happening. Great. So again, we can we can make sure that we that our count function does really behave like the core function does by doing the property based tests using the same collection generator that we had before. We then only need these few lines of code in order to test a thousand examples in this case of different collections and check that they behave the same way as the core count function does. Cool, so that was count. Let's move on to filter. Filter returns a lazy sequence of the items in a collection for which the predicate of an item returns true. And that predicate must be free of side effects. Filter can, can take a predicate on its own without a collection, and this will return a transducer. For the purpose of the talk today, we're not gonna cover that part. We're just gonna look at the case where we have filter um, with a collection. So let's look at building this up. So we know that we need to return a lazy sequence. And if we have an empty collection, that should have the, the filtered result should have a count of zero. So it starts empty, it's going to end up empty. So we can write a test where we're asserting that we're gonna get a lazy sequence and that the count should be zero when we start with an empty collection. 
So we can make this test pass easily by just um, just evaluating lazy seek on the collection. So lazy seek takes a body of expressions. So in this case, the, the collection, and it will yield a, a seekable object, which is then only invoked when it's first called. So it's lazy because it's not actually invoked until we call it. And then that result will be cached for any subsequent calls. Okay, so this makes that test pass. Does it work to just build this up recursively in order to in order to use collections with multiple elements? So here's a simple test where we've we've got uh, the numbers zero through nine, and we're going to filter just for ones that are even. So we could build this up recursively. Let's have a look at it uh, this way first. So we're going to have our recurse point with a loop. We're going to start with a collection. And we're going to have the results going into a vector, so an empty vector. So again, when the, um, when the input, when the collection is empty, we're going to return a lazy seek of the results. So we end up just with a with the empty lazy lazy sequence if we start with a with an empty collection. And until then we're going to recur through where we pass the rest of the collection as the new input. And then if the predicate is true for the first for the first input, we're going to conj that first input into the result. So we'll add the add that input into our into our vector. If it isn't true, we'll just pass through the result as before. Okay, so this works for this works for that test, and we can also add more tests, and these also pass. But they pass, but they're not actually lazy. All we're doing is converting the result to a lazy sequence. So we're not getting any of the, any of the benefits of the laziness because we're actually evaluating them as we go through. The reason for this um, we can look at because conj depends on the collection type, and so it is realized immediately. So as we were iterating through, we were realizing the, uh, the, the filter every time. So cons is different from conj, cons is actually lazy. That's because that adds an item to the start of the collection and it will always add to the start of the collection, and in that way, it can actually be evaluated lazily. So given that, let's see whether we can refactor our function that gave the right results but wasn't lazy into one that is actually lazy. So we can do this by just thinking about it slightly differently. So we can pass through to our lazy seek, um, say, a collection where we've used cons. So whilst the... Whilst the collection is not empty, so here we've got when seek call. So seek call will return true as long as it's not empty. So then we're going to we're going to um, we're going to recurse through. So if the predicate on the first sorry my alignment's gone off a bit here. If the predicate on the first collection is true, we're going to cons that first item to a lazy sequence of all the rest of the items. So all of the rest by recalling my filter with a predicate and the rest of the collection. If that predicate didn't hold true, we're just going to recall my filter with a predicate and the rest of the collection. So in that way, we can lazily build up our collection of items where the predicate has held true. When we've got that, we then pass that through to lazy C. And in that way, our test pass and we are actually we are actually running my filter lazily. So that's great. We get some more understanding. Maybe we got some more confidence for using our filter, uh, how we can use it, and some of the consequences of using it. So here's a question. How do we get a vector containing just the even numbers, given an input being a vector of the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? 
So this is something that always stumped me early on, um, looking at closure, because it's like, okay, I can just filter this for even, that's great. Only we don't get a vector back. What we get back is a lazy seek. So in order to convert that through to the vector that we want, we have to take our lazy sequence and uh, take that into a vector in order to get the vector that we required. So when we're using something that light filter, which returns a lazy sequence, we need to be mindful that the collection type that we get back is not necessarily the same as the collection type that we started with. So if we're wanting to do more things with it, we need to be mindful of that. Okay, let's move on to map. Map takes a function and any number of collections. Again, we're not gonna look at the case where no collections are passed. In that case, it should return a transducer. We're not gonna cover that in the talk today. But what map is gonna do, it's gonna return a lazy sequence consisting of the result of applying functions to the first, to the set of first items of each collection, and then followed by applying functions to their set of the second items, et cetera, until one, of those, one or more of those collections is empty. So at that point, any additional items are ignored. So let's build this up. Let's start just with a single collection and we can then write our function analogously to what we just did with filter. So again, we're going to cons, instead of when the predicate holds true, in the case of filter, we're gonna just apply the function to the first item in the collection and we're gonna cons that onto the result of applying the filter to all of the rest of the items in the collection. Okay, so that's great, that works. Can we extend this to two collections? Well, we can do it in this way here, where we, we had the second error C where we had the function and then two different collections. And we can just say when both the collection one and the collection two contain items, we are going to apply the function to the first items of collection one and two, and then cons that result onto all of the other results to come. So that works. But map can have any number of collections and we can't write out that infinite number of collections. We could look at building this up recursively. So looking at the, the third arity down here, um, we can have function with two collections and then, and then a collection of any, any more collections. And we can recursively go through these um, when, the, when the collection of those additional collections, so when we've got two collections and then more, when that more is empty, we can just apply my map with the function in those first two collections. And when there are, are additional collections, we could apply uh, the function to the first two, have that then become our first collection, and then apply the function to and then map through with that result with the next item, with the next lot of collections in our, in our arguments. So this can work. This can actually give us the correct results in many cases. But what happens if we have non-commutative um, functions? So here's an example. If we are to... Um, apply vector function to a vector of vectors, that should result in a lazy sequence of uh, map vectors. In the function that we wrote though, that test will fail. And that fails because we're just getting the result from um, mapping the first two collections. So that will give us a vector. So in this case, we have AD, BE and CF. And then we pass that through again with the with the third with the third item, and so we end up with nested vectors rather than the rather than the result that we want. 
So this all comes down again to the fact that we're not, uh, we're not using um, the laziness correctly. So how can we build this up lazily? So let's just um, put this in English first, what we want to do. So we could take all of the input collections, so however many collections that we wanted to map through, and put them into a single sequence. We could then reorder that sequence so that we take, so the first collection will be the first elements of all the, of all the initial collections. The second collection in our reordered sequence will be all of the second elements, et cetera, et cetera. When we've got that reordered sequence, we can map the result of applying the function to each of those reordered collections in turn. So there's some manipulation of the collections so that we can lazily, um, lazily map through them. How does this actually look? Oh, yeah. Um, so we could, we could define in my map um, the area to where we get the function, the first collection C1, and then all the other collections. And what we want to do is we want to apply the function to those reordered collections. So where we've reordered them so that all the first elements are together, all the second elements are together, etc. So we could pass um, the, the combined sequence of collections so consing C1 into the other collections, we could pass that single, that single sequence through to a function called reorder, which does that manipulation for us. And then with that result, we can apply our, our a function through those to get, our, to get our map function. So what does that reorder function look like? So looking at reorder, it's going to take in our sequence of collections, and then when every one of those collections has items in it, so when um, seek C holds true, we can cons the result of mapping the, the first elements of each of the collections to the result of mapping all of the subsequent elements. So in this way, we build our reordered collection which we can then apply our function across. Because both reorder and my map are um, referencing each other, we need to declare uh, need to declare one of them at the top. So this can take a, a little while to get your head around just what's happening, but we need to reorder our collections so that we've got all of the first elements together, all of the second elements together, and then we can simply uh, map our function across them. So that's map. Let's just move on uh, in the last uh, five minutes to pmap. So pmap is like map, except that we, need, we want the function to be applied in parallel. So this is only useful for computationally intense functions. So where the time of the function dominates the coordination overhead. So where it's worth, um, worth putting in place the parallelization. And PMAP is going to be semi-lazy, and we'll see quite what we mean by that as we, as we build it up. Okay, so let's, we, we said that we needed to have a um, computationally intense function, so let's do a mimic of that by defining a long-running job. So this is a function that can take any number of arguments and we're just going to sleep for a thousand milliseconds so one second and then we're going to in this case we're just going to apply a plus 10 to each of the arguments so we're going to do a simple operation but we're going to have a, a sleep in the thread for a thousand milliseconds each time we call it we can write a test to check that that long running um, job function works so if we, if we set ST to be the system time, we then call our long running job. In this case, with just a single item, we can then effectively stop the clock and time how long that this test takes. And we can, we can assert that 
running that long run, running that test, running a long running job is going to take more than one second. It's going to take more than the one thousand milliseconds because we got the sleep plus the um, the execution time. Okay, so that passes. What about if we're if we're using maps? So we're actually using the, the core closure function map here rather than anything that we've developed just, just within the test to check how this is working. So we map the long running job function across, um, across in this case, a vector with four items in it. So we can assert that it should take more than one second. And in fact, it should take more than four seconds. So the, the thousand milliseconds per item. But when we do that, the test fails. And the reason is, again, the fact that map is lazy. And so the time that we're measuring in this case is just the time to make the new lazy sequence and not the time to actually execute it. So we need to do a little bit, we need to do uh, a little bit else to make sure that we actually realize um, the function as we go through rather than just, um, just calling it. So we can define a function test time. So very similar to what we had in the test, but we're going to, we're going to apply a realized lazy sequence function um, when we call our long running job. So that realized lazy seek is going to take in our map type. So for the test that we got at the moment, that'll be map. It's going to take in the function and the collection. Um, and then we can define the realize lazy sync. It's going to, it's going to, um, we can set in a loop the set to result or res, um, applying the map, applying the function across the arguments for the map. So that will give us our lazy seek. And then by adding the when call, we're going to call that. And so we'll realize it as we recur through. So in this way, we're going to iterate through our collection and we will actually evaluate it each time. So we will realize that lazy seek. So in this case, we can, we can run our test again. Actually here, I'll just change it. So it should be 1.1 seconds should be greater than, than running my PMAP with, um, the, with the vector with the four elements in. So we know each one doing long running jobs should take a second, but if they're in parallel, it should just take about the second in total, plus that little bit of execution time. So how do we get this test to pass? We need to define our, our my PMAP function. And this time we can, we can say that our results is a lazy seek where we've, we've mapped the function as a future across all of the collections. So we're using closures futures. So we can create futures of each of the each of the items where the function is where the function is applied to the items in the collection. When we have that lazy seek, we can deref the results. So this is where we actually call the future and map the futures through to the realized results. This though will fail. And it fails because we're just generating a lazy sequence of futures, which so the futures aren't actually evaluated until we deref them. So as soon as the futures are generated, we are dereferencing -refer de them, and so we'll get that block in the thread. So this will actually take the same time as Matt did, a little over four seconds. So what we need to do is to generate all of the futures before we start to deref any of them. So how do we do that? Well, if you remember back to filter, we had an issue initially when we used conj because it wasn't lazy, but this can actually be of use to us now. So if as we're iterating through our column, applying the function as a future to each item, we could conj that future into a, into a, into a vector. And so because conj is realized at the time, that future will be generated as we're iterating through. So in this way, we can generate all of our futures in advance. And so we have our, we have our lazy sequence of generated futures as results. 
when we've generated all of those, we can then deref them in the same way. So we can map our lazy sequence of futures that have been generated through to our lazy sequence of actual results. We can then extend this to be able to take any number of collections in exactly the same way that we did the map. So we just need to apply that, that function across the reordered collections. So exactly the same as we did with map. So we've now um, written PMAP as well. We can check that the behavior of that, that function as well as all the others um, behaves exactly the same as the core functions do using our property-based tests. And hopefully now, after understanding those core functions, understanding how they work, so thing, extra things that they can do that maybe we weren't aware of before and things that we need to watch out for, some of the, the issues, we can safely use them and be more productive in our day jobs. So base jumping, if you jump with the same setup as you did from a skydive, you're gonna end up in problems. Skydiving, you get to go fast quickly. You get to the, stabilize your body before um, deploying the chute. That's not necessarily the same in base jumping and you can end up in all sorts of problems. So what I'd urge you to do is in all of the work that you're doing, really understand how all of the functions work so that you can use them appropriately and not end up taking a jump, which you really don't want to do. Thank you all for being a part of this today. If you've got any questions, I'll try to answer them online. Um, for more details of, of those functions that I wrote and also the property-based testing, there's links to the source code in GitHub um, for my blog, which is uh, linked to the bottom of the screen. Okay, thank you all very much. Bye.